Welcome to another Couples Academy show. Today we're talking about high risk factors that influence affairs. Join us now. Well, good morning, Danielle. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How'd you sleep? I slept and I'm up and I'm ready to go for another great episode. Good. Good. (laughs) Let's get it to all of you who are all over the world, wherever you're calling in from, from the UK, from Australia, from Asia, from Africa, uh, Latin America, wherever you are, we're glad to see you here this morning. Uh, We're talking about high risk factors that influence affairs. Now, oftentimes we have to have conversations where we kind of go a little bit deep and unpack things because I think a lot of times people look at affairs and infidelity as such a black and white thing. Um, And we can overly simplify what we do not understand. And we're here to provide critical information for you that gives you a deep dive understanding about the complexities that are associated with an affair, which is right in alignment with our series, Overcoming Infidelity Complexities. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been hitting it from different perspectives. And now we wanna talk about historical background, your personal historical background that may contribute to what happens in an affair. Because generally when we're taking couples through the recovery process, the very first step that we have to jump into is full disclosure. And when you're fully disclosing the affair, we have to get to the why. Why did this occur? And oftentimes we're pulling straws, trying to figure things out. We think we know, we may know, or we may have no clue. And that creates frustration for the betrayed spouse because they're like, I just don't understand it. I just don't get it. It creates frustration for the offender because they don't know why this happened. And so therefore, how do we resolve it? So that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, they truly don't know. A lot of times they don't know why they did what they did. And that can be very frustrating for the hurt uh, partner who's always wanting to know more and who's always wanting to understand how could this happen? Why did this happen? And for the offender, many times things are so deeply steeped in their past, in their upbringing, in what they saw, all these things that they can't really identify with it anymore. It's so buried. Those are the things that have to get unearthed so that they can release them, submit those things to Christ, fully heal and become a new person. So this is really going to be an interesting talk because you might be sitting here and be able to identify for yourself some of your own brokenness that you've brought into the relationship. Mm -hmm. It might really um, highlight some of the reasons why you've done things because we have all fallen short of the glory, have we not? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. First, before we get started, I just wanna welcome some people. Good to see you, everyone. Hey to Leticia, Jamoke, hey, I see you. Dee, hello. I see we have some folks coming in from Toronto. Welcome, Erica. Good to see you, LaShawn. Good to see you, Rhea, all the way from Australia. Willie, hello, 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 hello to everybody. Good morning, guys. So let's let's dive right in. We want to talk about some of the high risk factors. And one of the ones that I think has the greatest influence would be our family history. It is true that infidelity runs in a family tree. It is something that is passed down oftentimes from parent to child, or it may even skip a generation and go to the next. But but just as you, uh, we talk about the family marinade all the time, Danielle, how oftentimes we're soaked and saturated into a family culture, whether good or bad, and uh, we bring that into our adult relationship. And so therefore, when it comes to infidelity, this is a bad behavior and we have brought it in. And so one, one of the key things that we're talking about here is modeling. You know, children often mirror what has been modeled for them. And yeah. modeling is one of the most powerful, powerful uh, things that you could ever do. You can model success, right? Because success leaves clues. <clears throat> you can also model failure or failed behavior because it leaves clues. Absolutely. And 
sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so and so the reality is we have to understand that either you're consciously aware of what happened in that household because of Mr. Such and Such is always coming around. Um, who's I never met Uncle Such and Such. It seems like he's new. Where did he come from? So yes. all of these inappropriate relationships are showing up. And we, from a distance, observe it. We don't quite understand it, but we see it. Or we may be consciously aware. Dad was a rolling stone. You know, mom, you know what? She she had somebody on the side. And what happens is consciously you realize that it's a bad thing. It's bad behavior. Yeah. But something about being in an environment, you become a product of your environment. Just like they say, you're the sum total of your five closest friends. If you want to know who you are, take a look at your friends. Well, likewise, in your family and dy dynamic, that's where you're raised and shaped and molded and fashioned and formed. And when you become an adult, you may play out what you saw in your home. Last point, Danielle, I don't want you to jump in. Sometimes you're clueless about what has happened. Have you ever been shocked and surprised? You're like, dad, that dad's hit, what? And, and, and you're, but even though you didn't know what was going on between mom and dad, or aunt, uncle, cousins, brothers, you could feel the tension. There, there, was, there was animosity, there was anger, there was frustration in the environment of the home. You don't know what caused it, but it caused <laughs> vulnerability. And what happens is when these vulnerabilities take place in your household, it leaves brokenness in the person. In essence, a child can become injured and that injury doesn't manifest until that child enters into adulthood. And now they play out in adult relationships, injuries that took place in their childhood upbringing. Absolutely. When uh, we did our communications uh, masterclass, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that I shared, I think it was the communications masterclass. One of the things that I shared was how as a child growing up in an abusive home, when I would see fighting take place, when I would see somebody getting punched or thrown against the wall or dishes breaking, somebody getting thrown into a wall unit, all this craziness, I would go and I would get under my kitchen sink. Recently, the house was like for sale and I went and I looked at the house. It was so weird to actually see the kitchen as an adult, how small it was and how it was in that little um, kitchen sink door right near the pipes doing this. And later on, when after we had had children, we had two small children at the time, overwhelm, frustration, dealing with you. We're not on the same page. Struggle bus city, okay? Struggle bus going through struggle city. Mm -hmm. I found myself in a closet or in the pantry with the door closed, lights off. I had to have the lights off like this. And it hit me and I was just like, what in the world am I doing? And so I think what you're saying is so key. It's almost like a wake up call because many of us are very much unconscious about the behaviors that they're bringing into the relationship and also um, your parent, your child parent relationship as well. Just in as a whole, how you're interacting with the world you are oblivious to the effect that you're having. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a marriage and obviously we're two people with our two different backgrounds and our two different marinades and our two different issues coming together into a marriage. And all I'm looking at is your issues. All I'm looking at is how you're acting. I'm completely unaware of how I'm acting because I brought stuff as well. This is why we are such proponents of counseling because that's the only way for you to really get um, introspective about stuff and have a third party be able to help unearth stuff that you've buried just to cope. So I think that's a powerful point. It really is, and there's so much more to go, but that is a powerful point. Here we have Jaguar who leaves a comment who says, my husband's father was unfaithful throughout the entire marriage, even fathering children with multiple women. My husband grew up thinking that was normal and it bled over into our marriage. And this is exactly what we're talking about, that residue, that marinade. And so here we, we've got to get to the point as adults where we realize, you know what? I'm no longer a child. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I became a woman, I put childish ways behind me. We've got to be able to break that curse, start from scratch, do something entirely different to change the dynamic. That's what's necessary in order to make this thing pop.
right? So we're talking about we're talking about family history, but let's jump into the next one. The next one is critically important. It's if you come from a single parent household or a blended family household. Now we're talking about influences, all right? We're talking. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Got my coffee. She she hid for you. On, on handing me, handing me some yeah. coffee. Mm -hmm. So thanks, mom. Anyway, so what happens is single parent or blended family. Now think about this. If you come from a single parent household, there is a deficit. You only have one parent. Okay. So that means that the normal relationship and interaction that you would have with either your same sex parent or opposite sex parent is not there. So something is missing in that intimate relationship within the confines of the home or or if you come from a blended family it is very difficult and takes quite some time for you to develop a close relationship with that step parent and so in that there's an intimacy there's a nurturance that is missing and oftentimes when you feel like you haven't gotten it in your household, it leaves a parent or a parental deficit. And oftentimes we will seek out a partner who can fill that parental deficit. We realize that they cannot. There's still something missing. There's still something that I'm longing for. And because we can't find it in a normal relationship, we seek that nurturance. We seek that affection. We seek that closeness outside of the marriage. And it, it increases the possibility of an affair. Now, there's many people who come from all of these circumstances we're talking about who've never had an affair. So I don't want you thinking, uh-oh, my life is marked. It's going to, no. But good point. good point to make. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. But there is an influence that goes beyond mere right, wrong, good, bad. And I think it's important to understand these complexities because as you begin to delve into your own history, you say, man, I did, you know what? Me and my stepdad or stepmom, we didn't really have it then. I was always longer for something. And I guess that that influence, you know, what happened in my marriage. Yeah, you know what? I didn't really have my dad in my life. I didn't have my mom in my life. Maybe that's why I have an issue with women because of the relationship that I did not have with my mother. And that, so these are the things that we got to think through that contribute to why we do what we do. All right, there's a comment, Daniel. It says, I find a lot of men from uh, the Caribbean tend to have the kind of behavior and think that it's normal. Women accept it too. I, I will agree that it's definitely an issue that you find in the Caribbean. It's an issue that you find in Asia. It's an issue that you find in Latin America. It's an issue that you find in Africa. It's an issue that you find all over the world. I think, unfortunately, manhood, masculinity, uh, the role of male and female around the world is so skewed. Now you do see it popping up in strong ways in different regions and cultures around the world, but I think it's something that we're all susceptible to. And we have to change how we view, view male-female relationships because many men do have this, my <laughs> wife is my servant, my wife is there to take care of my needs and I can have my spouse and my mistress on the side. It is what it is, it's a part of the culture, in fact, Danielle, I counseled a couple where that was the mentality. Listen, she knew what she was signing up for before we got married. I don't know why she acting brand new. You know, in my country, I'm not going to name the country. That's what men do. We have a main woman and we have several women on the side. So so don't abandon your culture. So what? What you 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 don't have an allegiance to your culture anymore. And she said, you know what? I'm not a slave to my culture. I'm not going to live a life in a marriage unfulfilled because of the cultural norm that you grew up in. So these are the challenges that people are facing. Absolutely, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier, um, you were talking about the blended families. And I just think about so many different types of blended families out there where you do have two parents that do come together and try to work to blend the families, to actually make it so that the children that are having a new parent feel comfortable. But then you also have it where um, you have a partner, uh, one of the parents that wants nothing to do with the other parent's kids or the spouse's kids. Then you have it where there are um, some kids that have their own other parent. And then you have some kids in the family that both of the parents are their parent. 
So there's that divisiveness, right? Like if, if mommy and stepdaddy are my half brother's actual parents, you can see how that would also cause some divide. So when we're talking about all these influences, <clears throat> we all have some negative contributing factors. And then you have some people that have none of that going on and they still choose to have an affair. I think the key here is being able to recognize that there is some brokenness and being willing to see and become conscious of that brokenness if you are struggling with infidelity, right? Because we're thinking like this is, you know, this is my, I'm, I'm macho, you know, this is my Caribbean heritage. This is how we do it. But in that in and of itself is brokenness. You can have broken culture that has you doing things for generations that are constantly breaking marriages and breaking families. And it's an institutional kind of a thing that goes on for generations and generations. So the fact that she says, I'm not a slave to my culture, that kind of thinking is what it takes. It takes for you to not be a slave to your marinade or a slave to your upbringing, a slave to what you saw and what was always made to be right in your uh, lineage. Breaking out of that mindset is the beginning of being able to change and do, do things differently. Absolutely, totally agree. We have a comment from Rhea. Hey Rhea. Yeah, both of my parents had affairs and mother-in-law's was continuous, wow. Yeah, and, and it's a real thing. And and that's the history we come from, but you're not where you came from. There was a hip hop lyric. You're not where you you're came from. where you came from. You were, it's not where you come from, it's where you're at. <laughs> so- And you, where are you going? That's right. Because wherever right. you're at right now, you can get up, pick, take up your mat and walk. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Absolutely. Right. So, so, so let's go to the next one. Um, physical abuse and chronic conflict, uh, chronic conflict in a family. So if you are suffering physical abuse from a parent or some pro uh, progenitor in the household, if there's constant conflict, either that you personally are engaged in or you are exposed to, and I think, Daniel, you were just referencing that you came up in an environment where it was very hostile and you saw a lot and, and that can leave a, a, a part, a person broken. Now, specifically they were talking about males not that uh women are oblivious to this but when it comes to males <clears throat> sex is often used as a antidepressant it is used as a drug so just as we see how people smoke weed mm. and how people drink alcohol and often they do it to sedate themselves right they're yeah. using it for sedation uh or to medicate an issue. Either they're trying to escape a feeling or they're trying to experience a feeling. Well, we know that when uh, a person engages in sex, there's a releasing of chemicals and hormones and it's a feel good experience. That's for both and, men and women as well. Yes, there it is. Mm -hmm. And so sex is used as a drug to escape your conflicted reality based upon what you've uh, seen in the home. Now, if you've done this as a child, OK, maybe you prematurely got involved in sex or used other things when you are now in an adult relationship. And guess what? You experience conflict. You're in high crisis. Well, obviously, for most couples, if we're fussing and fighting and arguing and tripping with each other, we're not having sex. And so if the only way that I can re relieve this stress is through sex to feel better, I will then step outside of my marriage mm. and do something that gives me a feeling that I cannot experience with my partner in my marriage. Absolutely. LaShawn says, I grew up in a home where all the men in my family were cheaters. I thought it was normal because they took care of home. See, and that's, that's part of the learned behavior. We learn we, by ob observation, <clears throat> We're learning by observation. And so to your point, Hassani, wherever you learned that sex could soothe my anxiety, then now it became sort of like, the potion, you know, like the magic potion to heal my pain. Because whenever I engage in sex, that anxiety, that feeling of lack and loss goes away. And this continues to go, man. This is this is such a huge problem for so many people. Like I can think about people in my own life, friends who I know that that's what they were doing. They were using sex to soothe pain. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And at some point we have to realize that behavior does not help. It only hurts, harms and hinders and causes further destruction in a marriage. Corliss mm -hmm. has a question. What can a wife do to support her husband after an affair? After we have talked about the personal history and we have recognized that seeing family members have affairs like it was normal contributed to the affair. <laughs> OK, so what can you do to support? your husband I, mean, I think it's doing more of what you're doing continue to have those conversations you know if you have a spouse that is open and willing to communicate with you the brokenness and is working with you to seek their own healing you are blessed because that's almost half the battle Hassani and I are always talking about the power of agreement mm -hmm. it is incredibly powerful when you can get into alignment with your spouse on things and be willing to dig up all that crap, release it and do something different. So if you guys are having these types of conversations and you're able to recognize, hey, these were toxic behaviors that we don't wanna bring into the future of our marriage. We wanna leave it right where it is and set a new course. I think that's a great uh, path to start on. Absolutely. Um, one of the other high risk factors, Danielle, is sexual molestation. OK, when a yeah. person has been molested by an adult, it could be yeah. an older sibling. It could be a parent. It could be an aunt and uncle. What happens is in that experience now, whether it's happened one time and he or she touched me or whether it happened for you, like, for instance, I know somebody who was molested by their father from the age of four to the age of 21. Now that sounds extreme. That sounds crazy. How in the world could that happen? You have to understand that in addition to the physical sexual uh, influence, there is a manipulation of the mind. There's a twisting that takes place. So maybe your situation is not that extreme. Maybe it happened for a couple months or a couple years and you didn't say anything about it and they made you feel guilty. And if you tell this is gonna happen and now you begin to protect the predator from what has happened to you, there, there, uh, there's now guilt and shame associated with a sensual sexual act. So now, because you've never dealt with that, you've never found your healing, you enter into an adult relationship, you remain silent, you don't tell your spouse what you've gone through, which is very common. You hide your sexual history from your from your mate. And so now there's ambivalence that goes into your marital sexual affair and you can't fully experience the pleasure of it because it is shrouded with guilt and shame. And yeah. you have this mentality and concept of good sex versus bad sex. And because I can't experience good sex with my spouse, somehow I wind up having more fulfillment in the bad sexual experience because that's how I was shaped from a child and infidelity can become something that you struggle with. Yeah. And I, I wanted, this is a good place to bring that balance back in to say that, of course, we know that everyone who has been, who has been molested, isn't going to be, have affairs. We know that to be true. I mean, it really has a lot to do with your personality style. If you're the type of person that responds to trauma by hyper arousal, you're the type of person that could tend to do things like that. If you're the type of person that deals with trauma by constricting and suppressing, then you're likely to move away from it and be the exact opposite. You know, if if your parents divorce, come hell, come high water, you're not going to divorce. You know, if you were molested, you go and make sure that, you know, you check every dot and cross every T with your children to make sure it never happens to them, you know. So there is a balance to be brought to this. But if you know that that's how you have responded, that you have been molested and you've experienced these things and has caused you to have this insatiable desire that cannot be resolved mm -hmm. by the action. And that's what makes it insatiable. You keep doing, you keep doing it, thinking that it's gonna soothe the pain and it's never gonna soothe the pain because that's not the solution. Absolutely, Danielle. Um, Tashika has a, has a comment. I experienced a lot of the things you guys are mentioning in my upbringing. I had no idea it had such a huge impact on some of my life decisions. This is good stuff. And you know what? The, the reality is many of us aren't aware and we find out later in life, but guess what? It's never to learn to gain a level of awareness and make course corrections for the rest of your days. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Danielle, another contributing factor um, is um, adolescent promiscuity. Mm. That's the real thing. So mm -hmm. when you're introduced into sex at a young age, 
the more partners you have, the more experiences you have, it can create dissatisfaction when you get into an adult relationship and it can create um, distorted desire. It can, it just has a long-term impact. And so it increases the probability or possibility of an affair. And, and so that's why, you know, if you have, if you have children, you really want to train them, raise those children up and you, you really want to teach them. You know, a lot of times parents aren't having these conversations with their children about yeah. sexuality and purity and children learn where television, social media, society, their friends, and they're getting all the bad information and they have such negative influences because of the music and because of the movies and because of everything that's happening. And it really influences how people show up. Yeah. We have a comment from Noose Wrath. It's that she says, my husband doesn't want to talk about his affair or refuse to give any information about his affair. What does this, what does it indicate? What does that indicate, Asani? Uh, my husband doesn't want to, well, yeah, it indicates that there's something that he may be hiding. Uh, if he doesn't want to talk about the affair either, he doesn't want to do it because uh, he doesn't want to hurt and give you more hurt and pain. Like for instance, is you know I cheated, but if I got to tell you all the details, it's going to destroy you, it's going to crush you, and I don't want to do that. So he's trying to protect you from further hurt and pain, or he's trying to avoid the consequences of what may happen if the truth comes out. You may leave him. It may be the end of the marriage, end of the family, end of the reputation. There's so many things going on, but at the root of it all, it's fear. He yeah. fears if this comes out, I don't know what the consequences are going to be. Absolutely. People will hold on to that truth for dear life. And so you have to, if you want to stay, if you want to restore it, you've got to help them understand that it's okay. And I would say seek help. Like this is not something you can do on your own. I don't care how many conversations you've had with your husband, trust and believe when you get into the counseling process, you're going to need to have another one. So oh, man. Have somebody guide you through it. And, and that's why we're here at Couples Academy, because this is the first logical step that we take in the recovery process, full disclosure, where we guide you through a process for all of the truth to come out uh, in that process. All right. Well, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is a uh, man. This really and, and I'm, I, I just want to read it because trying to articulate it on my own doesn't capture the depth of this particular one. Now, many of us have children uh, who suffer from learning disabilities. Yeah. They may have uh, disorders or maybe you have had one or you have a sibling. I just want to read this because this is really powerful. It says that those with um, these type of diagnoses of report difficult childhoods. People are always yelling at them. No one ever sees, seems pleased with their behavior. Uh, they, they, they're they never quite good enough. They always seem to be in trouble. They can't even seem to finish anything on time. Life is very difficult for them. People and even friends have a tendency to shun them. Authority figures <laughs> seem like nuisances at best. Hmm. They don't fit in well with the environment and are often in trouble with bill collectors, with the law, with their family, with bosses. One word, it says those with high risk personal histories are often singled out for therapists to see, doctors to medicate and pastors to pray for. And as a result, they have a high need for nurturance and reassurance. These individuals are rejected by everyone. It just makes me think about those, the outcasts of society, right? Those are the vulnerable ones that you know, wherever they walk, whatever community will accept them, they are in because everyone has rejected them. So anybody who will accept anything about them, they'll say yes to. So it's a very dangerous place to be. I remember we were on a cruise one time and I don't know why this woman caught my attention, but she was that woman. She was incredibly socially awkward. Um, and I just, I think I ended up laying next to her on the cruise, you know how you have those beds? And she was very socially awkward. Um, just she had asked me something um, about, do I think it's OK for her to lay out in the sun and fall asleep? Well, I said, you know what? You might want to put some sunblock on. And so that's how we got into a conversation. <laughs> but I started to see her throughout the, uh, the, the cruise and she was just a mess and like kind of clinging to everybody and anybody. And I heard her making certain comments and I thought this poor thing is so lost. She is willing and able for anybody who would accept her and show her any attention. And that's what you're speaking of. And sometimes mm. 
unfortunately, um, if you have any kind of special needs or mental disorders, you can tend to be that person, but you're still forced to go out in society, right? And, and figure out how to do life. And you become a very vulnerable and mm. become a victim to certain groups that would prey on someone like that. And, and, and these individuals who've had this upbringing and who have these disabilities, they're already dealing with their own insecurities, uh, their own self-esteem issues, uh, confidence issues. And for someone to say anything, whether it's genuine or manipulative, right? that's all it takes. And they are hook, line and sinker. And so I'm just like, oh, my God, like, you know, we don't realize how we're shaping our children or how we're impacting them or those that we are in our family or friends. We really have to do a better job. Guys, I hope this is helping. This this is some powerful stuff. Hold on, There's a comment. I wanted to read this. Uh, Steve Stephen says. These are the people that Jesus favored. Isn't it the truth? Mm. <laughs> Jesus did. Didn't he favor the misfits? Yes. It makes so much sense because his love is overcompensating for every deficit that they have. And I think that's the point. We all come into uh, these relationships with so many issues, idiosyncrasies and deficits. And we are trying to fill those gaps and those holes with the wrong things. They never can feel it. That what that is why it becomes an insatiable need. And we keep doing it over and over again. It's just like the drug high, right? You get that first hit. I don't know. I'm not a drug addict, but I've heard you get that first hit and it's high. And then you can never achieve that high again, though you keep going for it and really? going for it until you have utter destruction. And that's what we want to avoid. The answer is in the source. And that's where you have to go get your healing. So, 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 so true. Because, Danielle, no matter what your background is, no matter which one of these uh, you resonate with, it has created brokenness. And it requires that you go to the cross. The, the You know, Yeshua is here to restore all of us. That's what he's here for. Some of you call him Jesus, but his name was Yeshua. And so once you go back to him, he's able to heal it and to restore everything. Remember... It's not just a an emotional thing. It is a spiritual thing. And Danielle and I were just talking off air about the importance of really unpacking that component of it, because really at the foundation of it all, that is what it's all about. Uh, guys, we have just a couple minutes. I see a question. I'm going to go to a quick commercial break. Now, listen, we've been talking about the Moving Forward program. There are many of you who are seeking help. You don't know where to turn. Our Moving Forward program is designed to give you what you need. You need to call um, our number at 678-200-8996 or go to our website, cubsacademy.org. Ask about it. Here's a quick minute video. We'll be right back. We've put this powerful program together uh, for individuals that need help, that need a little bit more. And it's a community of individuals who have been where you are and are on their journey to having the best relationships that they can have. Daniel, really quickly, you know, I was listening to some of the men in the group um, <clears throat> last night and they were talking about the impact that last you know, Monday night's call had because we were dealing with some real things. It was a very vulnerable conversation that we were having that really helped couples begin to see, you know what, we can do this. There, there's hope, there's healing. You know, we can be restored. 
There's others who have been where we are, they've overcome it, and now we're on our path. And that's what it's all about. We say this all the time. It takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a community to keep a marriage intact. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. Um, listen, listen, I'm excited. You're excited. We have some changes that are coming to the show. Uh, by next week, we will have the opportunity for you to actually call in. Now, many of you are actually texting your comments in and we're responding to it, but soon we'll be able uh, to have our lines open and you can call 678-200-8996. We're going to be taking live calls. So if that's you and you want to be on here live as we kind of talk and walk you through your situation, uh, we'll be able to do that. We're also going to be having you know, featured uh, individuals that we do group therapy right here on the air. It's going to be a phenomenal experience. Um, we hope that you're enjoying this show. We want you to continue to tune in. You need to be clicking the subscribe button on our YouTube page. You need to be sharing these videos every single morning. There are people who are going through situations and they need a word of encouragement for the day. And we hope that you will be an advocate with the Couples Academy show to get them what they need. And so, guys, we love you. We hope that you got something out of today. We will see you tomorrow for another great episode on the Couples Academy show. Bye, guys. Can bring us down, can't hey, nothing bring us down. Our love is too high. Bring us down, can't hey, nothing. <laughs>